Here is a different skull. So let's take a quick review of what was said earlier. The cranial compartment is composed of single frontal bone, which is further posteriorly continued with the largest bone that is parietal. It comes in pairs and, of course, the most posterior bone, the occipital bone. Left and right sided temporal bones occupy most of the temple. And then the central position of the sphenoid bone practically exposes its greater wings to both left and right sided temple. On this skull, we would be able to remove the skull cap and to take a look from the above to try to verify and to identify the position of ethmoid bone being the last bone of the cranial compartment. This is superior view. So what we see after the skull cap has been removed is practically the base of the skull with its multiple irregularities but in essence it is something that's relatively easily sorted out dividing the floor of the cranium into three different respective cranial fossae the anterior cranial fossa the middle cranial fossa bilaterally and posteriorly it is the posterior cranial fossa let's take a closer look, let's find out more about the ethmoid bone and its absolute position within this arrangement. Let's just zoom in and focus on the ethmoid bone itself. As it was mentioned earlier, ethmoid bone is placed between left and right halves of the frontal bone. I hope no one will be confused because the frontal bone is mostly seen as the bone of the forehead. However, it does have a horizontally running part which dips, dips deep into orbit and it produces the roof of the orbits, cavities where eyeballs and associated structures are inserted. In the very midline, we're finally able to see exact position of ethmoid bone. So this set of multiple openings represents the ethmoid bones, cribriform lamina, through which fibers of cranial nerve number one, all factory fibers will pass from cranial cavity into superior nasal cavity and provide special sense of smell. At this point, ethmoid bone meets the lesser wings of the sphenoid, practically forming yet another unnamed suture. And perhaps the most prominent part, which we can see here, is part of the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone projecting itself pretty much high into cranial space and this projection is known as the crista galli. So by doing this we have all eight bones of the cranial compartment. Here is a skull cap with a suture which has been removed and now we can take a look at the next video what are the bones of the facial skeleton. talk in this part of the video about bones of the facial skeleton. The facial skeleton appears to be very neatly arranged set of multiple bones that will form all the prominent features of the facial skeleton. So probably the best way to introduce them is to go from superior to inferior direction from medial to lateral. Therefore, we're going to start on the anterior midline where left and right sided nasal bones are going to meet each other, but also each of the nasal bones, as it could be seen here on the lateral view, will additionally attach to the nasal process of the maxilla. Two nasal bones will form the bony part of the external nose and what will continue further anteriorly and inferiorly in a living person would be practically the cartilaginous part of the external nose. As we go further from nasal bones, we will find out that the bone that we will encounter next is going to be upper jaw bone or maxilla. There are two maxillae, they're quite firmly connected to each other, and although most spoken languages would refer to it as just a single bone, upper jaw, please remember that we do have left and right sided maxillae and each maxilla will contain up to eight permanent teeth 
in adult person. Maxilla is quite irregular in shape and it will send multiple projections. For example, this one will be the frontal process that'll make the joint with the frontal bone. Also, maxilla will have its zygomatic process in order to meet the zygomatic bone or cheekbone. And most inferiorly, we're going to have the alveolar process of maxillae that are practically to allow insertion of our teeth and to form the upper jaw. Further away from maxilla, but it is one very small bone and quite difficult to observe unless you have the skull in front of you. So let's try to do the best possible zoom, keeping the skull steady. We will have the bone, which shows a very minute but very important opening that will allow us to go from inside the orbit directly into a nasal cavity. I hope that you would be able to see it with this projection. The bone is known as the lacrimal bone. Lacrima means tears. And of course, we're going to have both left and right sided lacrimal bones being part of the medial orbital wall. As we're moving further laterally, it is time to address those two large openings that are simply known as orbits. And no need to say it, orbits contain eyeballs, including also associated structures like muscles that will control the movement of eyeballs. Orbits are quite complex because more than one bone is involved in its formation. So as it could be seen, most of the roof is actually made by frontal bone with its horizontally oriented plate. The medial wall of the orbit is a joint venture between ethmoid bone, lacrimal bone, and to some extent we can even see here part of the maxilla bringing part of its own body to bring more material to the medial wall of the orbit. Maxilla is responsible to make the floor of the orbit. And finally, the lateral orbital wall is practically produced by the zygomatic bone. So at the very lateral end, the most prominent bone of the facial skeleton is the zygomatic bone. In English speaking countries, it is known as the cheekbone. The zygomatic bone is also showing quite a regular form. And with its multiple projections, it is going to attach here with the frontal bone, here with the temporal bone forming temporozygomatic arch, and with the bulk of its body, it will be firmly attached to the ipsilateral maxilla. The zygomatic bone is one of the more important contact points that has to be made between quite solid and quite thick bones of the cranial skeleton versus relatively thin bones of the facial skeleton. So we can see here zygomatic bone given that specific role. Back to the midline anteriorly, we're seeing yet another quite large and interestingly shaped opening that is known as the piriform aperture. The piriform aperture is actually entrance into quite a large space that is known as the nasal cavity. Within the nasal cavity, we will see multiple parts that belong to ethmoid bone, like superior and middle nasal conhe, but we will also have a single bone that will, together with the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid, form the nasal septum. Name of that bone is the vomer. Additional paired bones are observed inside the nasal cavity, Unfortunately, on this skeleton, it is slightly damaged, but I hope that you can still see this projecting part from the left side and this projecting part also from the right side of the nasal cavity. They are known as the inferior nasal conhe. Term conha means shell, but it also is usually referred to in English-speaking countries as turbinates. They're responsible to form the turbulent movement of air through nasal cavity so that air technically becomes purified, can collect a little bit of moisture from inside the nasal cavity, and also would be able to come much closer to the body temperature so the rest of the respiratory system is not going to be surprised if inhaled air is too cold or perhaps warm, warmer than what it should be. 
that is the piriform aperture with the vomer and paired inferior nasal conhe. The very last single bone of the facial skeleton is at the same time also the largest bone of the facial skeleton so we will remove the skull and leave this bone by itself the mandible the lower jaw bone quite solid quite massive and for a difference compared to upper jaw it is not considered to be made of two but rather there is just one mandible that contains up to 16 permanent teeth that are inserted into it. Truly mandible could be also considered the only for real movable bone of the facial skeleton. Many other health professionals will consider for example bones of the middle ear the malleus, the incus and stapes also being movable bones. Yes they are but they are not really listed as part of the cranial skeleton. They are introduced as part of the middle ear. The mandible has quite a large condyles bilaterally that will fit into mandibular fossae that we observe on the underside of the, on the underside of the skull. This is mandibular fossa on the right and this is mandibular fossa on the left. So when we place the mandible in a most appropriate and most anatomical form it is going to form the joint, the temporomandibular joint and a joint that will allow two different types of movement to happen. One would be mandibular elevation and depression as when we chew and the other one is going to involve a little bit more forward, backward movement of the mandible which is also required for better chewing and grinding of solid foods. The movement is not as accentuated as it is in some herbivore animals but in essence as we are chewing two different types of movement happen concurrently. Mandible at the same time becomes elevated and depressed but two different temporomandibular joints are in alternate manner protracted and retracted which forms fine grinding movement which is most importantly happening between teeth that are at the posterior ends of the jaw, the molar teeth. So for us as we are coming down to the very last bone that belongs to facial skeleton, the palatine bone or palatine bones left and right, let's first remove the mandible from its anatomical place so we can have a little bit better and more direct view to upper jaw and to hard palate. Let's zoom in and let's find some of the features that could be easily recognized. This is the alveolar process of mandible left and right side with teeth inserted into it and this is one of the maxillary processes which we were unable to see from anterior or from lateral exposure of the skull this is hard palate and therefore this part of the maxilla is known as the palatine process. Further posterior to the palatine process of the maxilla you can see here a very fine suture line that is showing us also the horizontal plate of left and right sided palatine bones. Together with palatine processes of maxillae horizontal parts of the palatine bones are forming our hard palate. Additional soft palate will be added further posteriorly that will make absolutely functional and physiological connection between nasal cavity and oral cavity preventing that these two cavities interfere with each other during regular daily activities. As we have the inferior view of the skull perhaps we can take a quick look and find out some of the other very interesting and important features that the skull will offer. Perhaps the largest opening that one can ever expect to see on the skulls of a human body is the foramen magnum. This is part of the occipital bone and through foramen magnum spinal cord will advance itself into spinal cord turning into medulla oblongata. Further to the left and right from the foramen magnum we are seeing two oval shaped 
slightly convex articular surfaces known as the condyles of the occipital bone and when the condyles of occipital bone meet condyles of the first cervical vertebra like this we're going to form atlanto-occipital joint a joint that will primarily allow for movement of the head in flexion and extension direction. Let's remove cervical vertebra number one and let's go further anteriorly relative to foramen magnum. This is the basilar part of the occipital bone. Inside of the skull it's quite smooth and it's no surprise because it provides direct physical support and holds in place medulla oblongata. The basilar part of the occipital bone meets the body of the sphenoid at this point and that is something that we'll pay a little bit more attention when we take a look in a separate video for all the important features that the base of the skull can offer. Since we're seeing the skull from inferior and slightly posterior direction, we have a wonderful opportunity to take a look also into a nasal cavity but from posterior direction. As you can see there is a firm partition between left and right halves of the nasal cavity and this is the most posterior part of the vomer. Here are palatine bones and we have two relatively large openings that will be contact between nasal cavity and the superior pharynx or epipharynx. These openings are in Latin terms known as coane. Inside the nasal cavity we have conhe, the shells, however openings or posterior nares that some textbooks are referring to them are coane and they will be direct contact between nasal cavity and epipharynx. Further to coane we're seeing those quite large fairly irregularly shaped projections. They are known as the pterygoid processes and they belong to sphenoid bone. If we take a look from a lateral direction we can see a little bit more of its irregular shape and its position relative to maxilla. So we're going to have two pterygoid processes left and right and each of the pterygoid processes will be composed of two laminae, two plates, the lateral plate and the medial plate of the pterygoid process. This is an interesting area again for attachment of same name pterygoid muscles, medial and lateral, and these muscles together with masseter and temporal muscle are going to be involved in a process of mastication or chewing.